Welcome to uh, Sunday night, although this is actually Monday morning Q&A. Things are beginning to get busy. Gigs are coming in, my word. Uh, so I'm hoping that we don't go into a second lockdown and uh, the things uh, begin to sort of uh, to uh, uh, start you know, cranking back into motion and we can return to uh, some kind of safe, hopeful uh, normality. Um, so we've got a lot to get through today. Uh, I'm going to look at some rock kind of fusion-y type legato patterns, some intervallic ideas. Um, I'm also going to do examples number six to eight of our chord melody uh, thing that we started in week 15. Uh, I'm also going to play a really embryonic piece. Uh, I'm kind of, uh, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it nonetheless. It's definitely unfinished, this piece, but I'm going to use this as a vehicle to demo a gypsy waltz that I've written called Butterfly. Um, yeah, so as always, uh, thanks for your questions and your involvement. Uh, I hope you enjoy what's in this week's uh, instalment, if you like. Uh, don't forget, all the others are on YouTube. They're all available on YouTube as well. So at, by this stage, we're building up quite a kind of a, a repository of information. So dependent upon your questions, of course. So please keep sending me suggestions. Uh, yeah, on with the music anyway. Thank you. 
in this piece that uses a typical gypsy jazz picking pattern. I'll play it for you slowly. Well. Based around an upstroke followed by one downstroke that moves across three strings and you'll hear it used by Django in Dark Eyes, you know. Stockholm Rosenberg in the uh, Django Legacy film. That kind of thing. Um, everyone, John Jorgensen likes this one. There's lots of different permutations of this leg. And the idea behind it is, you play one upstroke, it's a three string chord essentially. So in, I'll play the lick from my tune. Starts on a B flat major chord, and we go up, B flat major with an added ninth. So we go up, and then I go all the way across to the G string and play one down stroke, but in semi quavers, one, E, and a. Not. We want it to be one, E, and a, two, E, and a. And three four, then we go G minor, then A7, so A flat nine, A7, D minor, so B flat, G minor, A7 or A, and that shape is a good one to start with with that particular chord because we can imagine that the finger on the E string stays in place whilst the, the first and second fingers can be removed to give you some punctuation, this type of sound. That's how you get the clarity. One more time, slow. And you hear it just all over the place in Gypsy Jazz. In week 15, we looked at a way of taking a simple melody first five ways or the simple melody and then four variations creating five in total uh, of approaching this with different sort of chord melody options the first one was to play octaves and block chords based on fourths or fifths this kind of thing blocked out So 
Then I think the second one, if I remember correctly, was uh, to play thirds and sevenths. That kind of thing. yourself of them in more detail by going back and looking at week 15. Then the then was one based on slide and sixth, I believe. I think it was this kind of thing. And then, uh, yeah, then tenths. Like so. And the final one was a, a a half note bass line idea where uh, the bass doesn't walk, it just stays on. This kind of thing. I think that might have been more complicated than what it actually was. I think it did that, yeah, actually. Yeah, it didn't go to the, to the E flat in that instance. Okay, so I promise you another further five variations. So today we're going to look at the first three of the remaining five. There's quite a bit in these, so uh, I'd rather look at less in more detail than sort of skirt over the surface of them uh, rapidly. So first up is number six, which is a walking bass type idea. Okay, so that's the same melody, but underneath we've got this. That's thought the bass line is by itself. Now the trick to this is to figure out what coincides and what lands in the gaps. So that doesn't coincide. This does. As does this. As does this. This is in the gap. This is together. Gaps. Together. Together. Not together, sorry. Then these are together. Together, together, together. And so figuring out which notes collide, rhythmically speaking, which happen at the same time, and which are syncopated. That way, you actually don't really see this. It might seem like it's two independent parts, one go, and another one go. But in actual fact, it's just one coordinated part. This happens first, then the melody notes, then these two events happen together. Then the melody notes, then two together. Melody notes, two together, two together. So it's kind of an illusion that it's two independent parts. It's more a sequence of events which we need to see if they coordinate or if they are separate and independent. So one more time, I'll play it really slow. Okay. Now the same finger in here for the F notes goes to a different finger. So the same position, but different finger. I switch to a tritone sub here. I mentioned them last week. And that's example number six.
Okay, so this is well chosen uh, chord melody on just some of the melody notes. So. Harmonization here, two five one, D minor seven flat five, G seven, bass five. So what I'm choosing to do here is relate the melody notes in this case, say B flat to B flat thirteen, then to E flat nine. B flat, F minor, B flat 13. Okay, now these are E flat 9 chords. Then diminished chord. B flat 7, the 2 5 1. Come to C minor. So C minor is an F7. F11, B flat 13, a few more times slowly, B flat 9 here, diminished, B flat 7, 2 5 1 going to C minor. We're looking at quartal chords, they're chords that are based on stacks of fourths, kind of like this type of thing. Where each note is separated by four scale tones. Okay, so I'll play for you one time. It's a kind of more modern angular sound. So really, we do break away from the fourth a little bit here because we do something that's more parallel motion based in the in the uh, the second four bars. But this is based on uh, harmonized going between B flat seven mixolydian and E flat seven. For this section here, we have quarter chords, and then a section of parallel diminished chords. Where's my garment, I think? Back to quarter. Again, this is from B-flat mixolydian. And then what I did here is a kind of an F7 to a six type chord. Uh, so that's an F7 with a bass five. Just because of one we hadn't seen before. It works quite nicely. So slowly. A subtle shift there. Then. It's nice to diminish thing. So what we'll do next time, we'll look at uh, numbers nine and 10. So I'm hoping by now we're beginning to build up a kind of a vocabulary of different possibilities for chord melody ideas. So ranging from octaves, thirds and sixths, playing uh, punctuating uh, third and sevenths, playing just static minimum bass lines, then walking the bass line, then using quartal chords, 
uh, and then using block chord melody on occasional melody notes, not every single melody note, just picking them. Usually to do with where it lands rhythmically in the uh, in the phrase. Of course, this melody line is a teaching device. You know, you should be able to do this with a standard, or more importantly, with a tune of your own. It'd be really good. So next week we'll uh, we'll come back to this and we'll look at numbers nine and ten. We'll put it to bed. Okay. I had a request from Damien to talk about uh, some of the more intervallic playing that he'd witnessed in uh, in some of the tunes that I played, uh, and I've got to say I point uh, him and everyone to the guitarist Joe Diorio. He's probably my point of reference, certainly where this all began for me, and a book called Intervallic Designs for Jazz Guitar or something along those lines. It's a great, uh, I'm terrible for titles, but it's a great book. It's a really, really good book. So here's an idea that I gleaned from that where, where I realized that Joe was really good with sus4 arpeggios. He really had them down. Uh, so I took, a st and I continue to take this as an idea, take a very small motific uh, concept and just move it all, all over the guitar, stack things one on top of the other. So for the purposes of today, this is all going to be C7. Okay, so C7, C mixolydian. I'm not going to do anything fancy scale-wise. Just going to keep it in this one simple tonality coming from the key of F, but it's the five chord. It's a C7. Play this with a bit of overdrive as well. Although this will work you know, equally well with a clean tone. It works great on Selma style guitars, you know, that you can do, you can play this. It's just an idea. You can play this on anything. Okay, so here's a C7 or C suspended fourth, which will work against C7. Uh, arpeggio just in one octave. That's all we need. Root, four, five. Now again, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to keep things here to just where the root note is found on string six, on five. On string four, reaching over to string three. And on string two, reaching over to string one. I know we can do all the other pairs as well, but I want to try and keep this concise and to the point. So, so here's a C, so it's four. Now I can play that in the middle strings, and then the treble string. Okay, so any of these ideas can be moved in octaves. If you Assuming, of course, we've got enough range to do so. Okay, so that's a C. Okay. But I can also do, do a similar idea from every degree of the scale. I just need to observe what type of four or five it might be. So as it's coming from F major or C mixolydian, we have C sus four. We have a B flat with a raised four. Because this sonality has an E natural, not an E flat. Then we have a A, G, F. And from E, it's an E flat five. Because it's a B flat, not a B natural. Yeah. So we have these kind of arpeggios. Okay. So we can move along the length of the string. Maybe it's easiest to go from this C here to this C. And I'll call them out. So we have C, sus4, D, sus4, E with a flat4, F, which is regular, regular4, G, regular, A, regular, B flat with the raised, and then back to C. And so on, okay? So you can do that along any pair of strings. really starts to happen here when we start stacking them one on top of the other. So take a restricted range and we're going to go across the neck and just play whatever we find because these are all good against C7. So here I have C. In the middle C strings I have the B flat. And on the treble strings I'm going to have uh, G. And that for me now exists as an, as an arpeggio in and of itself. Okay, and I practice this from every degree, so maybe I go from the F, from the G, or from the D. And you get these kind of uh, unusual sounding arpeggios that are different each time and can be really moved around. So anything I play here, 
I can take those four notes and transfer them in octaves. Choices available, so here I could go, or in this case, making sense. Oh, that, that, that makes sense there. Uh, now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to just run some of these uh, arpeggio ideas against the C7 kind of New Orleans style fusion e backing track. I hope so. Just run a couple of these really slowly. This one, maybe I'll take that fragment and move that in octaves. Maybe I'll go from here. So over the same groove, I'm going to demonstrate some legato patterns that you might uh, wish to get under your fingers. This was suggested by Jack, he was asking about uh, some of the sort of uh, uh, fluid legato playing that you might hear, you know, players like Alan Hines, uh, inspired by you know, another Alan, Alan Holdsworth, of course. Um, now these patterns, these sort of uh, fragments, if you like, can be used in every style of improvisation, uh, particularly jazz improvisation. Uh, but the, the thing that's going to make them sound a little bit more fusion here is just the tone, really. Uh, but the patterns can be articulated in any way you like. But for the purposes of this uh, uh, section, we're going to play them using kind of legato type of technique. Okay, so if we work on the principle that C7 is going to be the basis of everything from today, right? So there's only really three intervallic patterns if we look at three uh, adjacent notes in C7. And that is you're going to see three consecutive tones, right, between C to D to E. It's three consecutive tones. That happens everywhere you find C, D, and E. Okay. Uh, you also find that same pattern between B flat, C, and D. Anywhere on the guitar. Okay, so that's definitely a pattern that we need to be able to negotiate, three consecutive tones, okay. We also see a pattern of a tone followed by a semitone. Like, for example, there between A, B flat, and C. But we also see that uh, between E, F, and G, I think. Yeah, of course we do. Okay, so that's that pattern reoccurs. Again, same thing. Anywhere on the guitar. So we need to have some way to kind of frame that particular pattern of a semitone and a tone. Okay. Now, another pattern that we see uh, recurring within any sort of diatonic scale is a tone followed by a semitone. So in this instance, we're going to spot that between um, G, A, and B flat. And we can also see that between C, D, and E flat. Oh, sorry, we can't. Wrong scale, sorry. We're, we're C7, aren't we, of course, yeah. Between D, E, and F, forgive me. So again, you know, these things reoccur all over the place. So if I go just along one string, we might see two tones, tone followed by semitone, uh, semitone followed by tone, two tones, two tones, tone and semitone, 
So let me tell another tone. Two tones. And then it goes. Okay. So the only other real gaps that we have to worry about is what happens when we go from string to string. And that's something that we'll also look at. Maybe look at that one at a later date. But that's things like, for example, if I'm in C7 and I'm going to go do something there and I'm going to do something here. But there's a gap between. There's a semitone gap between this note and this note. Whereas at, when I mean a semitone gap, I mean there's a there's a semitone space. So there's actually a tone gap between those two notes. But there's a semitone that sits in between. Whereas these two notes, they're semitone apart, but there's no gap then adjacent. Whereas these two notes, and we should learn ways to uh, to fill those gaps in. Things like that. So that's another legato thing that we need to maybe concern ourselves with is how do we deal with switching from string to string? And, and we'll deal with that in, uh, in maybe in, a, in another week if this is something that interests you guys. Again, you know, keep the questions coming in or keep uh, the suggestions coming in. Okay, so. What I've done here, on any string, is figure out which of those patterns uh, lands under the fingers at any point appropriate to the diatonic harmony. And then I found a little way to play the notes that are neighboring, so the notes that don't belong. So we need really like three sort of little fragmented ideas here, based upon whether we're playing semitone or the tone or whether we're playing a tone and a semitone, or whether we're playing two tones. Okay, so we'll start with the semitone and the tone, right? So if I see this, and I have the potential to play this note, which is not in the scale, by going something like this. Okay, so if I'll just do regular legato, just diatonic. So anytime I see that pattern, I might frame it in with, that's not in the scale. So out, back in again. So I'll just play a few little phrases. The, the... So you don't necessarily need to play the whole phrase. There I could go and jump. So there, I sneaked in. So that's phrase one. So if I'm playing just a regular, say, rock legato thing, you know, Richie Cotton and all those guys, you know, I can kind of tag that onto the end of, onto the end of all that, you know, just to give me more of a kind of a jazzy flavour. So that's just traditional, you know. Really do a lot of that other stuff to be honest anymore, but but you know, but it's an option, it's available to you. By, by that, when I say that other stuff, I mean things that are just pattern based, you know. Into, I mean, I know these are pattern based, but the idea being is it's rhythmically the same each time, you know, groups of six or whatever, um, <clears throat> and it just repeats from string to string. Uh, it sounds great though, so you know, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't do it, but it doesn't tend to fit into the music that I play, but <clears throat> but it's an option anyway, okay? So that's uh. So that's what you might do if you find a semitone and a tone. And there, there's that thing we're talking about where you cross from one string to the next. I have to find something to say about that. But they're all options. You don't necessarily need to play this every single time you see a semitone and a tone, but it's available to you. Likewise, every time you see a tone followed by a semitone, like here. Those kind of things. I can do this. So 
So I could go. together. So that was this one. Pattern one, pattern number two. So whenever I see this, super slow, I can go. So again, if I tag that onto the end of some kind of like rock thing, you know, yeah. So then C. Those kind of ideas. of each. Making sense? Okay. Uh, and then the third one is wherever you see, so just to recap, you've got semitone and tone. Tone and semitone. Okay. Now for the two tones, this is kind of a Holdsworthian one for want of a better word. If I have this, I can go So if I've got this, I can go to whichever direction you want. So what I'm doing here is I'm finding a way to get these two notes in. So going around them so slowly. So that's not in the scale. Neither is this, but this is. So effectively I'm going around the notes that are in the scale. They're in the tonality. Okay, so I can move this along an entire string now. So instead of playing just the diatonic notes, I can go. That makes sense. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just uh, play a few of these patterns to that backing track and uh, I'll slow them down and call them out as I go and then it's up to you then to just play around with this idea. So I'm just going to play around with these patterns until I find a hit on anything that, that might be cool and then I'll slow it down. Okay. Uh, oh, there you go, that might be a good start. Yeah. Okay, so slow this down. So we start off with the two tones and went same thing here. And we've got the consecutive semitone and tone patterns. And we've got the string crossing thing there. And okay, so you can play around with these everywhere. Slow down that first example if I can remember it. I think I went. And here. There you go. And 
double speeds. I hope you enjoyed that this week. I hope you guys to get something from uh, any one of those topics. I know the time constraints mean that we can't really sort of dive into any of them too deeply, but I'm hoping over the period of time, as we look at the same topics from different angles, it builds up more of a composite picture of uh, uh, you know, something that's gonna be more substantive, you know, in terms of uh, being able to see things from different perspectives. Uh, as always, uh, please keep your uh, suggestions coming in. There was one thing I was going to mention, actually. One of those sections that we looked at today um, was, for my own practice, was inspired by that thing that we talked about weeks ago about logging our ideas. I use like voice notes on my phone, and I had a thing where, for some reason, it lost all the titles when I synced it up to my computer, and it just gave me a, a numeric value for everyone to tell me what it was. So I've had to sort of systematically go through a whole bunch of these, probably about a hundred or so. Um, and I've been doing it in you know, batches of fours and fives. And in doing so, I've uncovered a whole bunch of ideas of things that I had explored in the past and have kind of let fall by the wayside. Uh, and that stacked fourth ideas was something that I kind of used and it was there, but it was sort of just beginning to fade a little. So by going, back over these ideas, it put it back set and, you know, forward and center in my mind. And then I was woodshedding on it for ages. And then I found that in these recordings for this new album that I'm putting together, uh, those ideas are just coming out. So it's good sometimes to refresh your memory of things that you've looked at. So I would suggest uh, you know, trying to make some kind of record of the things you find when you practice. Because if you're like me and you're busy, you'll forget them. Uh, and every day it's like rediscovering new things that, that, that I've already learned. You know, the, the beauty of it as well is rediscovering something is a lot faster than, than developing an idea in the first place. To kind of refresh something that's already been placed there seems to take a lot quicker. Um, the process seems to be much uh, faster and it's just really a question of going, oh, remember that thing? Okay, great, it's back in the act again. If it's something that you like and you can sort of keep it in mind in a conscious way and then hopefully it'll filter into your subconscious so now I'm playing these patterns without even thinking about it. So. As always, thanks once again. Apologies for the uh, the late posting of this, but uh, hopefully you've got enough to be getting on with with the uh, with the uh, the sheer sort of volume of ideas that we've got now. Keep the suggestions coming in. Likes and shares are greatly appreciated, and uh, I'll see you next week. Take care.